have your Bible this morning, if you would open them up to the book of Matthew. word this morning, look into it, see what he's got to say for us. I was thinking as I sat there during the service, if Jesus were uh, to walk in here this morning and stand up here, what would he say? You know, that's, that's a good question. What would Jesus say to us? And uh, I think we could sum it up. In just a few words, he'd probably tell each one of us he wants us to believe in him as his, as his personal Savior, as our personal Savior. Trust him with all of our heart. And for those of us who have been saved, he would tell us to draw nigh, draw near to him. Um, I do know the message in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 to the seven churches. And Jesus told each one of them to repent. So he wanted his people to draw closer to him. And I want us to look this morning into Matthew 14. Matthew chapter 14 and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 22. I want to speak to you a while this morning on how to know when you're sinking. How to know when you're sinking. You'll know what that means when we read the text. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 22. We're going to begin reading there. I don't see any visitors this morning, but if we have one that I've overlooked, we're glad to have you. And we're really glad to have everybody that's supposed to be here. Amen? Amen. We have some, I think, on the road traveling, and let's do pray for them that they'll have safe, uh, a safe trip there and a safe trip back. It's a dangerous type of the time of the year. There's a lot of drinking this time of the year. There's, there's a lot of drinking all year, more than there should be, but especially around Christmas time, and I never have understood that. It's a terrible way to celebrate the birth of a Savior is to drink and get drunk. But that's the nature of man. But here in uh, verse number 22, Matthew gives us this report. It says, straightway, Jesus constrained. That word constrained is more than just telling them to get on this ship. It is actually compelling them. It's a very strong verb there. Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Let me read you this. You hold your place right there. In John chapter number 6, the Bible says that they were in the midst of the sea, which was about three miles out into the sea. They were in the middle of it. And the Bible says, and when he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary in about the fourth watch of the night. John adds that information to what we're reading here in Matthew chapter 14. So between the two texts, we know that it's night. It is the darkest part of the night. The fourth watch is between three in the morning and six in the morning. The Jewish day did not begin like ours at twelve. It began at 6 in the morning. So here this is the fourth watch of the night. Jesus is up on this mountain. He has told his disciples to get into the ship. He's compelled them to. And he's told them that he would meet them on the other side. Keep that in mind. Jesus knew when he told them 
what was going to happen. He knew there would be a storm. Uh, they didn't know it, but Jesus knew it. And keep in mind that Jesus is up here at the darkest part of the night. And the Bible said he saw them rowing. Listen, Jesus has his eyes upon us all of the time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Jesus has his eyes upon us. And the Lord knows what we're facing. And actually what you see, and I'm stopping here in the middle of my reading to explain this to you. As you look at this picture, Jesus is telling them to get on this boat, this ship, and to meet him on the other side. What you have here is actually a picture of life. You have Jesus leaving us and going to be with his Father. He's looking down at us as we cross the sea of time. And he has told his disciples to meet him on the other side. And that's what's going to happen one day. We're going to meet him on the other side of life. But during this trip, there's going to be storms. There's going to be times when we're going to be fearful. And so Jesus uh, tells us here in these verses that his eyes are upon us during this time. And the Bible said here in verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, Is it a spirit? They didn't know it was Jesus. All they knew is it was some man walking on the sea. And the Bible said in, in here they asked this question, is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship... He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, we don't use that word much, but it means extremely strong. When the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And you know, uh, long prayers are wonderful. But sometimes you don't have a lot of time to pray. And I'm grateful that the Lord hears just three words. Amen. Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. I like that word immediately. Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they were in the ship, or when they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We know, Lord, that it's the lamp and our feet and a light into our pathway. We know, Heavenly Father, that it's your way of speaking to us, not just this morning, but each and every day of our life. We have the opportunity to read your word as you speak to us. And I ask Heavenly Father this morning that you would help each one of us, Lord, and those that are here, I pray, Lord, you would help them to be uh, very cautious in their hearing. I pray, God, that you would help each one of us. Help me, Father, not to say anything that I don't need to say, but help me to say everything I do need to say. And I pray, Father, that your will would be done here in this place as it is in heaven and we'll give you praise for we ask it in Jesus precious name amen as we go through Christian life as we go through the life that I've spoken of a moment ago as we go through uh, the life that God has placed us in uh, and, and I hope this morning that each and every individual in this building has been born again I trust that you've been saved I, I trust and hope that you can remember a time in your life when you have personally asked Jesus to come in your heart 
uh, and be your Savior. If you haven't done that this morning, you need to. Uh, church membership is wonderful. That's wonderful. Baptism is wonderful. Doing good things are wonderful, but it won't get any of us to heaven. We must believe on Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This is what Nicodemus was told. He had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you find this throughout the Word of God, especially in the Gospel of John. The word believe is used over and over and over. And it's more than just a head knowledge. A lot of people have a head knowledge of Jesus, but they don't have a heart knowledge of him. The Bible says, with the heart a man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I really believe what that means is once we get saved, we tell everybody uh, that we've been born again, that we've been saved. But after we get saved, there is this matter of maintaining a fellowship with the Lord. And it's a problem that we have. All of us that are saved by grace have a problem maintaining fellowship with Jesus. We're going to talk about that this morning. You see this, this fellowship uh, that we're supposed to have with Jesus does many, many things in our life. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Actually, I could preach the whole message just on this one thought. But you know, this matter of walking with the Lord... Uh, we need guidance as to the decisions that we make in life. Life, many times we have problems. We come to a fork in the road. Sometimes the decisions that we need to make are crucial decisions. And we can't afford to make the wrong one. So we need to have guidance from the Holy Spirit, guidance from the Lord on what He would have us to do. And then we need to have the touch of the Lord on our lives so that we can tell other people about the Lord Jesus. I, I really believe that he has promised us that he would give us the power, that he would be with us, that he would help us if we would tell others about his son. And you know, we need the help of the Holy Spirit to remind us of the things in our lives that's not right. And, and listen, one of the things the Holy Spirit will do he will not only guide you, but he will tell you, he will point out things in your life and things in my life that's not what it needs to be. And then there's joy. Uh, we, all of us need joy. I need joy, and you need joy. Uh, my wife and I was talking about happiness. Uh, there's a lot of times that we're not happy. But happy happiness comes from happenings. And sometimes the happenings are not really anything to make you happy. And every one of us has those times in our life when we're really not happy. But according to the Word of God, we can have joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I don't know about you, but I need joy in my life. I really do. The joy of the Lord, according to the book of Nehemiah, is our strength. That's where we get our strength from It's the joy that we have in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit gives us that joy. We read that in 1 John. He tells us that when our fellowship is right, we will have full joy. And then number five is uh, in, along this line is he gives us comfort. He comforts us when we hear bad news, when things happen in our life that we uh, don't want to happen. In times of bereavement, that Rutledge, Rutledge family just went through and thank the Lord for comfort that he could give them and for you and I when we have loved ones and when we have disappointing times when our children in life don't do the things that they need to do. I tell you, one of the heartbreaks of life is when your children don't do what you've taught them to do. They step on your toes when they're little, but they step on your heart when they get older. Amen. And some of you have experienced that. If you hadn't, you probably will. But the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's our guide. He helps us when we're trying to understand the Bible. He helps us. He points out the truths that we need to know. Sometimes uh, the Bible reading becomes dull. But the reason it becomes dull is we're not seeking the help of the Holy Spirit in our life. And uh, and then we need the Holy Spirit to help us in our prayer life. The Bible tells us that we have the Holy Spirit to help make intercessions for us. 
with groanings which cannot be uttered. We find that in Romans chapter number 8. But having said that this morning, Satan knows the things that I've mentioned this morning just now are true. He knows that you and I depend heavily upon the Holy Spirit to help us in our life. And if he can cause you and me to get busy, to get sidetracked, to get caught up with things that really aren't important, uh, then he's done his job. And he wants us to ne neglect the Word of God. He doesn't want you to read this book. And listen, sometimes we get busy, but we need to have a, we need to have a time when we get along with the Word of the Word of God every day, and and really be it'd be good to have that time in the morning before your day ever begins. You can take the Word of God, and Satan wants to keep us out of this book. Amen. He does not want us reading. This book. He does not want you to be in the house of God this morning. He does not. And there are times people let Satan keep them out of the house of God when they can be there. One of the things I've tried to, some pastors don't hit this as much as I do, but I believe the house of God is very important in my Christian life and very important in your Christian life. I really believe it's important that we have a testimony that we love the Lord. And when if our neighbors see us staying at home, they know what we're doing, by the way. They, I've got neighbors on both sides of me, and, and one of them's got cameras faced toward my house. So I know they know when we're going and when we're leaving, when we're coming back. And uh, they know what we profess. They know what we believe. And let me say this morning, it's not just important to be in the house of God because of them, but it's important to be in God's house because this is what God has commanded us to do. Amen. We need one another in these days. And, the, and Hebrews 10, 25 says, we need one another so much more as you see the day approaching, the day of the Lord. It doesn't take much to keep some people out of the house of God. But he wants to keep you out of that book. He wants to keep you out of this house. He wants to keep you off your knees. He does not want you praying. There's one thing Satan fears, and that's to see one of God's people on their knees. I really believe that. Satan's got a lot of power, but I can tell you what. God will answer our prayers, and Satan knows that, and he's afraid of a prayer warrior. He's afraid, of a pray, he's afraid of a praying saint. He does not want us talking to the Lord because that's where we get a lot of our help from. God wants us to pray. He's commanded us to pray. And as a matter of fact, he expects us to pray. And then he doesn't want you listening to preaching either. He does not want you. That's why he doesn't want you in the house of God. He doesn't want you hearing the preaching but you know, he knows too. Let me tell you this. Satan knows this. Satan knows my flesh and Satan knows your flesh. I pray, I say, I pray this prayer a lot. God help me, I'm weak. I am weak. You may not pray that and you may not realize that this morning, but you're weak. When Jesus led the, children, uh, the disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane, he left the eight outside, brought the three in further. And when he came back, they were asleep. And Jesus looked down and he, he knew, he said, I know that your flesh is weak, but your spirit is strong. We may have a strong spirit, but our flesh is weak. This morning, our flesh is our enemy. When we look in the mirror in the morning, or at night or any other time, we're looking at one of our three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Satan knows that our flesh will help him defeat us. He knows that. And God has described broken fellowship in many ways in the Word of God. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22, he says, Return you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Backsliding. You hear people use that term. I backslid on the Lord. 
There are some denominations who preach when you backslide, you'll lose your salvation. That is not true. Amen. And I thank God for it. Aren't, aren't you thankful that when you get away from the Lord, you don't lose your salvation? Amen. You probably, you, if you're like me, you may you lose it two or three times a week. But thank the Lord when He saved us, He gave us eternal life. He gave us everlasting life. And I want you to know I'm not kept by the power of Ronnie Shiflet. I'm kept by the power of God Amen. unto salvation. Amen. I'm thankful he's got me in his hands and the devil can't get into there. Amen. 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 Read John 10 sometimes. In Matthew 26, 58, it said, it described Peter as following afar off. And after he had denied the Lord, uh, he even knew, he knew himself he had followed too far. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul said they had fallen from grace. Again, that did not mean they had lost their salvation. It meant that they had fallen away from the things of the Lord. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 16, the Laodiceans were told they were lukewarm. Jesus told the Laodiceans, I would that you were cold or hot. He says, but because you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. I know you may, and I probably don't realize this, but if Jesus was speaking to us this morning, I think it would be pretty hard. Jesus, if you look at Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he spoke, he spoke to those churches what they needed to hear. And I know there are a lot of people who don't like hard preaching. And sometimes people won't go to hard hear churches where they hear hard preaching. But you know what? Sometimes we need it. We need to hear what the Lord has to say to us. But no matter what it's called and how you refer to it, the results are still the same. When we're not walking with the Lord, we're not, when we're not prayed up and living our best, we miss the will of God. And our fellowship takes a hit. How many times a week do we lose our fellowship with the Lord? Because we're not what we ought to be. If you look at Peter's experience in the text that I just read this morning, my text this, my text this morning is not about what who moved his family to the uh, town of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a bad thing. And that's another message for another time. Lot shouldn't have moved his family to Sodom. He ended up losing most of his family because of what he chose to do. We're not talking this morning about uh, Samson, who had a problem with women <coughs> and had Delilah take him down. We're not talking about King David and even what happened to him with Bathsheba. This morning as we look at this text, we're talking about Peter, the Apostle Peter. The Bible tells us that he was doing, I want you to see this this morning. This really spoke to my heart. Peter was doing exactly what God told him to do. He got in that ship just like the other disciples. And he was even... Seeking the right fellowship. I want you to look in verse 28. And Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. He was in the ship where Jesus told him to be, which is the type of the church. He was seeking fellowship with Jesus. And we see thirdly that he was exercising faith that the others did not have. You think about this. I want you to think about this this morning. I mean, water, I can stay on top of water, but I'm floating or I'm swimming. How many of you can swim? Raise your hand. About half the congregation. You can stay on the top of the water if you swim. And my mama used to could float like a piece of cork. I used to be amazed at my mama up on the top of the water floating. But here was the man who walked on water. And as far as I know, other than Jesus and Peter, nobody in history has ever done that before. And I'm bringing this out this morning for a reason. 
Here's a man who was in the boat where he ought to be. He was wanting fellowship with Jesus so bad that he was willing to walk on that sea. And it wasn't still like glass when he was asking to do it. He was exercising faith. The others did not. And we can criticize Peter for what happened. But I tell you, he holds the world's record in walking on water. None of the other disciples made an effort. He was seeking to do the impossible. And you look in verse number 30. I want you to see this. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. He knew he was sinking. He knew he was in trouble. He knew something was happening. More than likely, he had taken his eyes off of Jesus. And he began to look at the sea. He began to see the sea and the winds. And that's what happens. That's what happens in my life. And that's what happens in your life when we take our eyes off Jesus. Amen. We begin to sink spiritually. And Peter, realizing that he was sinking, he did the right thing. He knew he was sinking, and the Bible said he called out for help. And Jesus, I like verse 31, and immediately, immediately, Jesus looked down. Listen, Jesus knew all this was going to happen. None of this took him by, uh, and caught him off guard, took him by surprise. He knew what was going to happen. He reached down, and he picked up Peter immediately. And you know that's what happens when you and I admit we've done wrong? When you and I admit that we're not where we ought to be with Jesus? When our heart has gotten cold? When it seems that our prayers are getting hung in the ceiling? It seems the heavens is this brass? And it seems like the Lord has took the last flight out of the country? That's what, listen, if we'll call on Him, the Bible says He'll immediately reach down and help us. And so in the process of doing these exceptional things, I want to, I want to major on that this morning. My time's gone and I hadn't even finished my introduction. <laughs> In the process of doing these exceptional things for the Lord, <coughs> walking on the water, I mean, nobody's ever done that. And let me say this, it may not be walking on the water, but I want you to know this morning that the Lord can help you and I do impossible things if we'll trust Him. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. God cannot just do the little things like helping us when we're sick or helping us pay a bill that needs to be paid or helping us get back and forth to church. God can do impossible things because there's nothing too hard for the Lord. But sometimes in the midst of doing all these things that we're doing, we take our eyes off the Lord. That's what happened here. I think sometimes preachers, missionaries, deacons, Sunday school teachers, sometimes those of us that are busy doing things for the Lord, we take our eyes off of Him. And we begin to look at other things. Maybe circumstances. And Peter realized his peril and his danger and he got immediate help. But I really believe this morning many don't seem to notice. This is what bothers me this morning. And I'm bringing the message to a close because I don't have time to preach it all. Many do not notice that they're sinking. And others don't even seem to care. That's what's heartbreaking. Sometimes they fail to do. Sometimes we, should I say we, change the pronoun there, we. Sometimes we fail to do what Peter did in verse number 30. He uh, Listen, as soon as he began to sink, he realized that he cried out for help. Amen. But for some people it takes days and weeks and months and years. After David committed his sin with Bathsheba, it was nearly a year before 
he ever got his heart right with God. And so the message this morning is, are you sinking? If I had time, I'd give you some, I'd give you some ways that you can know you're sinking. But you know what? I think many of you already know that. I think many of you know whether God's hearing your prayers or not. I think you know whether God's touching you and blessing you or not. And I think if you would be honest with me this morning, you would admit there's been times in your life that you were sinking, that you didn't have the fellowship with Jesus. Let me ask you this this morning, and this will answer the question yes or no. If you had to pray for someone in your family whose life was in immediate danger, and they only had seconds or moments to live, and your prayers were the only thing that would keep them here, would they live or would they die? Are you walking close enough with the Lord this morning to where you know your prayers would get through if you called on Him? There's sometimes, I don't think mine get out of the room. I'm telling you the truth this morning. I'm being honest with you. It is so easy to lose your fellowship with Jesus. So very, very easy. You don't have to go out here and commit murder. You don't have to steal, kill. You don't have to do all those terrible things, take drugs, whatever the case may be. Sometimes the little foxes is what spoils the vines. Amen? Amen. While we stand, while we get a hymn this morning, if the Lord is speaking to your heart about your life and about your relationship with Him and, or your fellowship with Him, won't you come this morning? Listen, we have this old-fashioned altar down here. It's not used enough. It's not used enough in our church back home. Every once in a while we'll have a meeting and I'll see some go to the altar back home. But I can remember days, listen to me, this is important. I can remember days in my church where the altars would be filled and there would be no room for people that have to sit on the pews or use the pews. What's happened to those days? When we took our needs before the Lord, when we took our, our, our heartbreaks before the Lord, when we took our sins before the Lord, what's happened to those days? We need to repair the broken altars as they did in the days of Elijah on Mount Carmel. The altars of our country, not just our churches, our altars need to be repaired. And we need to get down to business with God. Amen? Amen.